Good evening. I'm Father Kevin Waters from Gonzaga. Gonzaga University is committed essentially to all Christian points of value and compassion for those who are incarcerated and particularly on death row is a very central theme. The Catholic Church holds a profound reverence for human life and it has never been more clearly articulated than recently by Pope Francis. This is something that Pope Francis said last month. I have a dogmatic certainty. God is in every person's life. God is in everyone's life. Even if the life of a person has been a disaster, even if it is destroyed by vices, drugs, or anything else, God is in this person's life. You can, you must try to seek God in every human life. Although the life of a person is a land full of thorns and weeds, there is also always a space in which the good seed can grow. Jesus is above all compassionate. So I welcome you for this wonderful panel discussion this evening on the death penalty, which has as a subtitle, the loss of compassion is too costly. I now turn the podium over to Dr. Ellen Macaron of the Philosophy Department at Gonzaga. Tonight's program was created and organized by the Fellowship of Peace Foundation, a Spokane nonprofit working to end the death penalty. A bill this year will be introduced calling for the repeal of the death penalty and leaving in place life without the possibility of parole. Our lawmakers need to hear from their constituents in order for this policy change to go forward. The purpose behind organizing this particular panel is to provide expert experienced educa education directly related to the issues about the death penalty. All panelists chosen are in favor of repeal, although you may hear different reasons for their standpoints. Uh, let me introduce to you Jason Baldwin. He's one of the three men known as the West Memphis Three who were released from prison in August 2011 after serving more than 18 years in Arkansas for crimes they did not commit. He is pursuing an undergraduate degree and has plans to continue on to law school. Jason travels the country advocating for the abolition of both the death penalty and the juvenile uh, life without the possibility of par parole. Jason? When I was 16 years old, I, I found myself in an impossible situation you could never dream up or ask your, you know, choose to go into or just, you know, just woke, just wake up and when you wake up a day like that, you never think by the end of the day you would be facing what I was facing and what my two friends were facing. Um, a terrible murder had occurred in West Memphis, Arkansas and of three eight-year-old boys and the West Memphis Police Department were in a scramble to, you know, naturally to find who committed the crime as well as the whole town. Um, the night the boys came up missing before they were ever discovered to be murdered the next day, a man went into a Bojangles restaurant just right down the street from where the boys would be found the next day, covered in mud and blood. That man was never to be seen again, and the blood samples were to be lost. At that moment, I think we really lost any chance there was of finding who really murdered those three boys. However, even though he was gone and lost, the police were still in a scramble to find who actually committed the crime. 
I had a record, you know, since I was 11 years old, along with my younger brother and pretty much every kid in the trailer park I lived with, you know, for uh, criminal trespassing, which honestly was nothing more than hide and seek. This is how my name got in the database or, you know, got to be known for the police to bandy around after the blood evidence and everything was lost to possibly the only leak to actually committed the crime. Tunica Casino had just opened up in Mississippi at that time and um, Damien's parents were gonna go see it. And so they rented a TV and VCR and at the time the police had already questioned us several times about the murder and Damien's parents told us if the police come to the house tonight while we're not there, don't answer, you know, just act like you're not here and let them go on. And that's what we did. But this time they had an arrest warrant and there, you know, you couldn't just say, hey, you know, parents aren't here, you can't talk to us. And they were like, no, you're coming with us. So to make a long story short, at the time, I held on to the hope of DNA evidence proving my case because I had told the officers where I was at the time and they refused to, you know, listen to me, refused to accept the truth of my words, refused to accept the truth of everybody, you know, who knew where I was, which for me was mostly friends and family. But to them, they said, friends and family, they're close to you, they'll lie for you. You know, so I'm like, well, who, what, what kid is, is there any kid who is around anybody but friends and family or, you know, even teachers, and, you know, but anyway. I'm against the death penalty because it can happen to anyone and uh, anyone who is innocent. And once you take the person's life, you can't give it back. Um, that's why I'm against the death penalty. Thank you. Gloria Ochoa is a prominent Spokane attorney representing criminal litigation, personal injury, and family law, formerly a deputy prosecuting attorney, currently an adjunct professor at Gonzaga University. She's served as commissioner for the Commission on Hispanic Affairs and as chief judge for Spokane Tribal Court. Gloria is also an advocate of alternative dispute resolution. Well, I've had the uh, opportunity to be a deputy prosecuting attorney um, before I became a criminal defense attorney. So I have about 15 years experience uh, doing criminal law on both sides. Um, and one of the things that, um, uh, questions that I always ask a jury when I go into trial as a defense attorney is I ask uh, at the jurors, uh, what do you think is worse, convicting an innocent person or letting a guilty man go free? And I ask that question because as a juror, I want them to uh, give a lot of weight and make the, 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 the verdict that they reach that they know how serious that is and that it's our system is not perfect, unfortunately. Uh, as a prosecutor, I had the unfortunate opportunity of seeing officers uh, perhaps for being, uh, I'm, I'm going to say negligent, out of negligence, not uh, turn in reports that were accurate. Uh, for example, I have reports that said, you know, um, under oath, saying that a certain series of events had occurred in a, in a, in a stop and we would go and see the video and it was absent. So then as a prosecutor, ethically, you had to figure out how you're gonna deal with those situations. So when it comes to the death penalty, I have um, I had a discussion with Ms. Thorpe, a very thorough discussion, because um, this is one of those topics that most people don't go around talking about usually. It's a, it's a very controversial topic, whether you're on one side or the other. And um, I've uh, in, there was this one specific case that I brought, um, that her and I discussed, was in the Tri-Cities when I lived there. There was this uh, um, a very horrible case that involved this individual. His name was, last name was Sarah Steggy. Um, and he was prosecuted because he uh, offered to babysit a neighbor's four-year-old son, and he brutally murdered him. And um, he, after he was arrested, um, he confessed to it. He said, I did it. I liked it. If you don't kill me, I'm going to do it again. Um, so this person had some, uh, I'm going to say evil propensities. Uh, he asked to be executed. Uh, this is when he um, denied it or did it, uh, turned down all appeals. Um, and so when, when I'm asked about my position about the death penalty, it's, it's really difficult for me because there are people out there that uh, fall on the other end. This isn't someone that was highly under the influence or had a you know, crime of passion uh, or something that could be explained where you think, okay, this person made this really horrible mistake, uh, but there's someone that we can uh, treat, um, rehabilitate, and bring back into the community. Uh, this was an example to me as an individual that I really don't know what we could do with someone like that that will just tell you, if you let me out, I'm going to do this again because I liked it. Um, However, because uh, I've had the opportunity of having to do, again, you know, uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, some serious cases, people looking at 
uh, this particular case that I was talking to you about with the attempted murder, two counts of attempted murder, he had about eight other charges and two trials that we went through, but he was acquitted of all charges. Um, but he was looking at 97 years in prison. So I mean, these are like really serious allegations that sometimes are made. Um, and based on me seeing the deficiencies, I, if I'm asked that question, what's worse, convicting an innocent man or letting an innocent or a guilty man go free, I'm going to have to say let the guilty man go free um, because uh, you can't, again, you can't get that life back when there is a mistake. And I think one mistake is one mistake too many. Uh, one of the, I'm gonna kind of go through um, some of the reasons why there are inefficiencies or I'm gonna say errors in our system. Uh, one of them is erroneous eyewitness identification. Um, there's also situations with false and coerced conf confessions. Again, where the police, uh, they mean well, they're trying to solve a crime. A lot of times there's political pressure if it's a high profile case where they have, they're trying to find someone to put, a, put away for public safety. Um, I guess for people to feel that there's public safety and they're doing their job. Um, there, there have been people that have been interrogated for you know four, six hours and um, a lot of times, uh, and this is a, a common practice, uh, it is allowable by law for um, police officers to use what's called bluffing. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. So I can go ahead and arrest her and say, you know, I'm, I, I have evidence against you. Somebody's already confessed and told me everything that you did. We know what you've done. Um, and that's acceptable to, for the officer to lie to a defendant to try to elicit a confession or to elicit information. Uh, a lot of times you get um, investigations where the interviews aren't recorded, so it becomes the word of the defendant against the word of the police officer. And I can tell you as a defense attorney, trying to tell a jury, no, the officer's lying, that's not what she said, and have them believe the defendant, it's an uphill battle. Um, one of the other things too is that juries aren't always representative of the community, so you're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers, uh, specifically in Eastern Washington. Um, I tried a lot of cases in the Ben Franklin County area because I am bilingual, so my, my main focus area was on Spanish-speaking uh, defendants, and um, specifically in counties like Franklin County, even Walla Walla County, uh, you would have a Latino uh, defendant and there would be no Latino jurors. Um, Franklin County recall one case where my client not only didn't speak English, so he needed an interpreter, he also had immigration issues and you know, it involved an assault um, case. And uh, all the jurors were uh, farmers, engineers from the Hanford area. Uh, there was nobody that was representative of, of his peers. And, and you see that quite a bit. Like there's a, a huge disproportionality, both in, in uh, contact with law enforcement and from, of minorities, and also uh, there's a disproportionate incarceration rate for people of color, which is Native American, which are the highest overrepresented uh, in prison, um, followed by black, and then third would be Latinos. Um, and I, we don't have time to discuss this, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, I'm gonna say implicit, there's implicit bias in our, in our system. I think, uh, I'm gonna have to say that I really do appreciate what law enforcement does. Their whole goal is to keep us safe as a community, um, as a whole. However, there are our system, there's a lot of institutional bias and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work that needs to be done in cultural competence and of uh, also uh, training uh, law enforcement to make sure that all of these safeguards are put in place to where we do have verifiable um, and accurate investigations. But until such time, again, the same question that I always ask is if you're gonna have to err on the side of caution, I'd rather see a guilty man go free than have an innocent man being convicted or executed. Victoria Thorpe, author of Cages, has spent years extensively researching the death penalty system, advocating on behalf of human beings living under this sentence, and providing education to the public. Founder of the Fellowship of Peace Foundation here in Spokane, in May 1985, her sister was convicted and sentenced to death row in California. Eighteen and a half years later, her sister's case has not been heard in an appeals court yet. I'm going to read an excerpt for you. May 23rd of 1995, I sat in a frigid courtroom listening to a scripted dissertation slide easily from the Honorable Judge Thomas J. Williams' lips. I hope your witnesses were sincere and that you have found God. I hope that he forgives you. The meticulously groomed silver-haired man in a perfectly creased shimmering black robe peered over the top of his glasses and turned his head just an inch to his left as he spoke directly at the defendant. His melodramatic words followed the pronouncement that he was upholding the sentence to kill my sister. 
the reality of what that entailed was only just settling in. I'd watched a complete farce from beginning to end come to its conclusion, and I realized I would never be safe. My family was not safe. The system did not work. There were no checks and balances in place to ensure justice was served for all. There, this could happen to anyone, anyone without enough money to fight back. How do innocent people end up on death row? The subject is normally so far removed from the average person's life concerns and interests, its insignificance affords it little attention. Through my personal experience of living with the capital case brought against my sister, Carrie Lynn Dalton, it was revealed that our justice system does not always work. As a matter of fact, it's riddled with mistakes and personal agendas, and that's how a case like this one can lead to death row. A case with no body, no weapon, no blood, and no crime scene. As a matter of fact, the alleged murder victim had not even been declared deceased during the trial. As the judge pointed out to his jury, quote from the trial transcripts, Ladies and gentlemen, in the last question the DA asked, he mentioned that the, Melanie May in this case, is deceased. That's a fact for you to decide. It's inappropriate for him to put that in the question, whether or not Miss May is in fact deceased or not, because that's something for you to decide. And I read that to you from um, my book, Cages, that I wrote with trial transcripts, portraying my sister's trial exactly from the transcripts, so that people can have an a, account exactly of what goes on in some of these death penalty cases. It, this can happen with no evidence and no witnesses. Imagine how much easier number of traumatized witnesses and an abundance of forensic evidence can get screwed up, let alone could be misconstrued or even manipulated purposefully. What it boils down to is convictability, not always the crime. Ever since May of 1992, when the charges came down, I've been involved in my sister's case, and she and the co-defendants were represented as the despised population. And even though the alleged victim herself was a junkie who was in and out of the system, whose children had been taken away because of abuse, the jury was painted a picture of her as a young, helpless, yet misguided mother being brutalized. This is a secret to death penalty cases. They are emotionally driven. And the West Memphis Three case is a very good example of that. Um, hopefully you'll get some more information from Jason on that. These kinds of cases make careers. The more unreasonable the case you win, the more accolades you receive. And as I've made clear, in my sister's case, there was no body, no weapon, no blood, no crime scene, no evidence of murder or even a crime exists to this day. And my sister stood trial at the capital punishment level without even a victim. That's not supposed to happen, is it? We're told it's extremely difficult, difficult to get a capital punishment trial. We are told there are so many safety nets in place, but this is Carrie's reality. Such a case could, should never have gone to trial, yet it did. We were assured she'd never get convicted, yet she did. And it's ridiculous, we were told to fear for a death sentence. And then Carrie was told she deserves to die. We were then assured that it would be overturned in three years and here we are, eight, over 18 years later. She has never been heard yet in the Court of Appeals, and this is in California. She's still waiting state appeals level, never been reviewed. So one of the issues is that the co-defendant sat in jail from May of 92 to February of 95, and logically, we'd all agree that they should have gone to trial immediately with no evidence, no witness, not to mention a body. Um, what case did the state have? It would have been dropped if they had gotten their speedy trial. However, their public defenders had them all waive their rights time after time until 34 months later, my sister Carrie stood trial alone. At that point, they had gotten one co-defendant to give the DA the story that he wanted in return for a plea bargain. Another fact at the trial was the husband of the missing woman testified that he had held two conversations with his wife where she said she was not returning, and that was nearly a month after the DA's date claiming of her torture and murder. Another key point at the trial was a deputy sheriff who answered a call to the residents that very night 
the prosecutor claimed the murder had occurred. The call was placed by the resident. It was a call to investigate a burglary. After 18 minutes inside and outside of a small, tiny trailer that he investigated everywhere and in a vehicle underneath and interviewed her, he decided no crime had occurred of any type. And he also put in his record that she was a 5150. That normally means a mental case, but he testified at the trial that that meant she was wasted on methamphetamines. Also, the alleged victim had disappeared from her loved ones before, and it was unknown by them whether she was dead or alive for 10 years, but the judge did not allow that in the case. On this road to exonerate my sister, I've come to learn that not only are there many other innocents on the roads, but I've grown to see that those who have committed violent crimes are people too. They really aren't monsters. They aren't evil incarnate. The drugs are evil, the abuse is evil, I think even the mental illness can be said is evil. I have seen the humanity in the eyes of the individuals I've met, and I read the humanity behind the stories of many others and can say to you, but for the grace of God, there go I, or many of you. A family member of someone on death row, someone who's convicted of this, is rendered almost helpless as they watch what happens, and I love my sister so dearly. I'm totally convinced of her innocence, but even if she were guilty of a terrible crime, I would not want her to be killed. What would that say about me or about you if we kill another human being to show that killing is wrong? I grew frustrated waiting for the wheels of justice, and so I began speaking up, and now I use my sister's case as an example to educate others on what can go wrong and does go wrong with the death penalty. With the life and death as the sentence, we cannot afford to continue to have the death penalty. How can we enjoy our freedom and safety knowing others are needlessly suffering years of inhumane treatment and death when we can easily stop the process without any loss to ourselves? Dick Morgan has over 30 years experience working in corrections. Dick worked his way up through the ranks from correctional officer to captain to superintendent of the Washington State Penitentiary and state director of prisons. He has overseen three executions at the Washington State Penitentiary. I was basically born and raised in prison. I'm the third generation of four to work at the penitentiary in Walla Walla. Whatever you think of prisons, yeah, unless you've been there, it's, your thinking is probably a bit off, off the mark. I've been warden of three different prisons, and when I retired, I was director of the division of prisons with uh, over 17,000 offenders in prison. And uh, basically then, there were eight men on death row, the same as there is today. And as indicated, I had participated in three executions, two when I was captain and one when I was uh, director. Um, I'm also a board member of the Washington Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, yeah, which is why I'm here tonight. Now, uh, in case you think that my opinion was a, a luxury decision that I made after my retirement, I've always been opposed to the death penalty, but I have always found that the rule of law is something that uh, I have a lot of reverence for. And so when the death penalty and executions came my way, it was one of those things you wished you didn't have to participate in, but you do. Um, so uh, that rare and unfortunate uh, circumstance Time won't allow for me to go through the technical details of what happens during an execution. But I do want you to know, in speaking on behalf of the people that are involved with executions, no volunteers are ever allowed to participate in an execution. The spectacle of the first executions in the United States after it was found constitutional again, uh, that the spectacle that occurred in Utah and Florida that was absolutely horrendous and shameful uh, and how the staff behaved around that the one lesson we learned was that we will not make a spectacle or provide theater for folks uh, in Washington State so staff are assigned to carry out an execution with the absolute right of refusal and some do 
uh, on religious grounds, uh, personal beliefs, um, just because they don't want to be around that kind of activity. But the majority of them, and you will notice if you research the uh, history of executions in Washington State, there's never been a tabloid article about what really happened during an execution. After an execution, everybody goes home, and that's the end of it. I like to think that uh, those folks that participated with me were as, went there as reluctantly as I did. And if, but what I can tell you is that for such a, an occasion, they afforded those men as much dignity as could possibly be afforded to them. So, um, the many, many arguments for abolishing the death penalty are uh, individually more than enough to justification to abolish the death penalty. My issue is, let's say I've got ice water in my veins, I was a director of prisons, and I have to balance the books in a tight budget. Hopefully I'll be able to get through this uh, in the time I'm allotted. But the fact is, having been around death row for a large portion of my career and managing men of all stripes in a prison setting, there is no distinction of difference between a man on death row, a murderer on death row, let's narrow it down a bit, there's no distinction of difference between a murderer on death row and the two thousand other murderers that are being managed safely every day in the department today. No difference. Of those 2,000, over 600, 630 at last count, are doing life without. And actually that's, if you were to dig into the data, you would find out I'm a little bit wrong on that. There are 630 or more prisoners doing life without, but they might not all be murderers because you can wind up with consecutive sentences, say 500 year sentence, which is effectively life without. So the idea that uh, men sentenced to death pose a risk that they need to be ex executed for simply is not true. That is an absolute myth. Anybody tells you that, send them to me. I'll set them straight. Of the 2,000 murderers that are supposedly so, one minute, that are so supposedly so dangerous to manage inside a prison, only 5% of them uh, receive maximum security designation, the greatest resources that the department has to manage unsafe inmates. Um, of the 80 death penalty trials since 1981, there have been five executions. Six, that represents a 6% return, this is the ice water in the vein stuff, on the government's desired outcome. That's a very high degree of error rate that the government decides that in over 80 cases, somebody should be executed, but you've managed to get through to only five of them. Stated another way, it's the government process fails 94% of the time. Now imagine if you were me as a warden or a captain carrying out an execution and your government has sent you a person that has a 94% failure rate of meeting the legal thresholds for execution. Pretty scary. And finally, the most Reverend Blaise Supich, Bishop of Spokane, um, ordained to the priesthood in August 16th, 1975, and has been Bishop here in Spokane since the summer of 2010. Well, I've been asked to uh, address this topic from the perspective of uh, moral concerns, moral theology, and um, there are just three points that I want to make, but then uh, fold that into 
Another way in which we uh, need to consider the morality of this uh, very uh, searing topic. As uh, Father Kevin Waters indicated, we come from a tradition that has a fundamental respect for human dignity, that each of us are made in the image of God. And life is a gift from God. No one can take that. And if the state feels it has to do that to protect society, then of course that is another situation. But we have seen that in this country in particular, especially as Dick mentioned, there really is no need for the death penalty to protect human life. Even the prison population can be protected. And of course, by incarceration, the rest of the population can be protected. So our starting point is that fundamental defense of the dignity of human life. But we also approach it from the standpoint of realizing that uh, each one of us are on a journey. And not only are those who commit terrible crimes on a journey, but so are each one of us. And what happens to a society, to a people, when they lack of respect for human dignity in whatever form, it begins to erode in the consciousness of society a respect for human dignity. We have seen that over the years with the treatment of women in rape cases, where in fact women have had to even justify themselves for maybe saying things or dressing in a certain way, as though they didn't have any rights because of that until we confronted how that was eroding, that attitude, eroding human dignity as it came, as it applied to women, uh, we were not, as a society, ready to make changes. So we need to see what's happening to our society with the death penalty. Why is it that we are one of the most violent societies in the first world? Is it because we don't respect human dignity in so many different ways through violence, a lack of gun control, our entertainment world and our culture, and the death penalty, and the taking, from our standpoint too, of the child in the womb? For us, that's a consistent life ethic. And finally, I think it's important to remember, as, um, as was alluded to by Dick, the prison, popula the pr prison officials aren't the ones who carry out the death penalty, we do. We're a representative government. Each one of us has to ask the question as citizens, would I be willing to administer the drug that kills someone, to pull the plug, to, uh, to electrocute someone? It is each one of us who has to ask that question. We're a representative government. We're not a totalitarian regime. Each one of us are part of that decision, and we can't escape it. Now, as I mentioned, these three reasons we can all understand and talk about in a theoretical way. But I have been convinced over and over again that there really is no moral theology done unless we know the lives of people that we're talking about because it becomes so very abstract. That's why it's important to hear the stories of Victoria and Jason about their own experiences firsthand. I have one having lived in South Dakota for 12 years. There was a terrible murder. A young man was tortured, beaten, bottles were thrown at him by three guys who were terribly drunk on methamphetamines and alcohol tortured him terribly. They were all caught. The oldest one, who was a ringleader, was given a choice, as were the others, of how they were going to be tried. He decided to be tried by a jury. And he got life imprisonment. The other two thought they would have a better chance going before a judge. They got the death penalty. 
same crime. And the youngest one, who was least responsible, was one of the two who went before the judge. We pleaded with him to appeal his case, like the other one who got the death penalty, but he didn't want to. He said his life was trash. Why was it trash? Because ever since he was six years old, his mother would pass him around to her Johns to be abused sexually. He never lived in any one place for more than six months. His mother was on drugs. His life was trash. He wanted to die. And the state went ahead and complied with his wish. But not until, in fact, it all had to stop because the cocktail that was going to put him into death wasn't the right one. And so at the last minute, he had a reprieve. But he still wanted to die. And so the state went ahead and did it. And as I told the people in South Dakota, the people in the prison didn't do it. The governor didn't do it. We did it. And we have to own that. And the more we tell those stories, and the more we take a responsibility, that's when we will have the hope of some change. Why life without parole? We need to fix the entire system. We do have the best system in the world, but it is not looking at individuals. Um, and I would love it if we would look at each case individually. We need to change a lot of the process and the laws to do that. So what we are proposing, those of us who support the campaign that is going on now or the bill that is being um, submitted, is the alternative of life without parole. At least we have not killed someone. We're starting the process. We need to stop killing. We need to stop the cycle of violence, as everyone has talked about this evening. And us killing someone to show that killing is wrong has to stop. You have seen the statistics, probably, how many Americans are in favor of ending the death penalty, how many are not, how many are informed. We're trying to inform. It takes a long time to inform. As we get there, please let's stop the killing. <laughs> please, um, one of the things I would bring up, I was going to bring up later, I can bring up now, we may possibly schedule someone this year in Washington State. We have two men out of our eight on death row who are nearing the end of their appeals. Therefore, then comes scheduling. Even with trying to get um, this law passed, it probably won't get done in time, we'll need a moratorium. We need the governor. We have over 60% of folks who think they're for the death penalty still. How long is it going to take for us to educate everyone one-on-one? -on -one? You are aware and you understand that we need to look at people as individuals and judge their case knowing their background. As Bishop Supich said, look what happened to the young man he was talking about. Where's our, we, we own that too. We own not stepping up and helping out and taking care of that young man along the way. So it's a process. <laughs> so um, it is really heartbreaking to me that though there are more people against the death penalty, but they will not support a bill like this because they're afraid of life without parole. At least it's life. And I do know many people who have the death penalty and they do want to live and they do want to know their family. I do want to know my sister. The life without parole is the default sentence right now. You, you realize that legally, is that Holly gave me this. Um, <laughs> we're just talking about taking away the option of the death penalty. So we are trying to change the system one step at a time. And those who support the death penalty don't even like us saying we, you know, look forward to fixing the system more. <laughs> but you are a person of a sensitive and compassionate heart who understands. We need to look at this individually. There are eight people on death row, and uh, if the uh, death penalty were abolished, they would go to uh, life without. Now there's, uh, life without is not an uncommon, as I indicated earlier, uh, situation in the prison setting. There's well over 600 people doing more than they can outlive uh, in the prison system today. The denial of liberty is a huge punishment and it ought to be uh, the most 
grievous penalty that a government can inflict on somebody. And to say that you're going to spend the rest of your life uh, in prison is, if you think about it, that is, is a pretty horrible sentence. So for those people looking for retribution, that ought to be more than satisfactory. Um, from a practical standpoint, the youngest uh, murderer ever sent to prison in Washington State was 12 years old. Now, he wasn't sent back then. Society would have never thought of the term life without parole. Redemption was very much a part of uh, prison culture back then. You sent a person to prison to be uh, redeemed, and he eventually got out and, and lived a good life. So you wind up with, let's say, the 2,000 murderers. If they were all doing life without, that's a major prison running for 70 years just to confine murderers at an enormous expense. Personally, I think when you get to that point, people will have to reassess the value of life without. And, and that was my, my question about it. If we're just putting somebody there for the rest of their life, it doesn't seem fair for society to support that person and the whole system altogether. If they have murdered somebody, why are we not putting them to death? to send the message to, to the rest of the society to say, it is wrong to kill, and this is the penalty, penalty that you will face. I, I can see the appeals process going through there just to make sure we're getting the right ones, but why are we having to in prison for 70 years? Right. Well, I, uh, I get the rage, I, I really do. My issue is, Consider the libertarian movement right now and all of the con concern that crosses political lines, both Republicans and Democrats, are concerned about government intrusion into the individual freedoms of its citizens. For example, and I'll pick on the, 60, uh, or the uh, Second Amendment and the huge concern that people have that their assault weapon might be limited to a 10-round magazine as opposed to a 30-round and the huge amount of energy that goes in behind it. Well, the government can already lawfully kill you. Two of your governments can. The state of Washington and the United States government. And being guilty of the crime that you're accused of and executed for isn't 100% sure. Innocent people have been executed. And as we know, the process washes out uh, 94% of those the government originally thought should have been executed. So my concern is about government applying an absolute to a very inexact situation. The other thing here is that it really is a fallacy to say that the death penalty is a deterrent for other murders. Here we live in a country where we have the death penalty and we have the highest rate of murder of any civilized country. They don't have it in Europe, and the death rate by murder is much lower than it is here. So it really is, it, it, seems, uh, it seems intuitive that, sure, let's put this threat out there, you're gonna be put to death if you commit a murder, and that will make sure people don't do this. But it is counter to intuitive, it's the other way around. Because what we do is we create a culture of dealing with our problems by killing somebody. And when the state does that, it sends an enormous message to individuals that that's the way that we deal with problems. We terminate their life. And he's, Bishop Supich is referring to FBI statistics, not just like the Innocence Project or any other um, anti-death penalty uh, group. This It's a proven fact that it is not a deterrent. Um, and it has also been proven that at, when executions occur, violence goes up, including murder. Um, and beyond that, what are we as a society saying when we kill someone? 
we're saying more violent. So I, I agree also. And it, what about our part in creating the person that you're going to put to death? Jean Woodford, another uh, superintendent, she was a uh, warden of San Quentin in California. Right now they have 725 men on death row. They're not killing them, <laughs> but they're living their life in a single cell, solitary confinement, as uh, the, UN, the Geneva Convention says is torture. We, we do that today um, to many, many prisoners in the United States. But she, after the execution of uh, overseeing an execution of a man named Massey, she said they know that his childhood was torturous, as the example that Bishop Supic gave us, uh, a very abused young man who went through the um, foster care system. And we, as she would state in her article, we are part of developing him into the what we call monster, a person who has been abused so terribly, doesn't know how to function right, and one of her questions was, what if we spent the millions of dollars we did on his case, his execution, et cetera, instead on prevention, on foster care, on caring, on, on social um, programs rather than killing? We can save money by ending the death penalty. It's much more expensive to go through the death penalty process and, and killing um, than it is to keep someone incarcerated for life. And as Dick mentioned earlier, uh, we have maximum security, which is very expensive. And in his mind, working with them, not me, this is Dick, <laughs> saying he's worked with the men on death row and the men in the general population, and there's no reason to manage them that way. We can save money that way, but we also need to invest in restorative justice, as Dick was mentioning too, um, not retributive. We, we are, our recidivism goes up at all levels because all we do is punish. So we need to come back to compassion. We need to care about each other is basically it. And we need to end the death penalty. I was just kind of ahead of that. When I went, to, went into prison, I was 16 years old and I went in as an innocent person. But I had to make the decision. I mean, I was heading into a place where I did not deserve to be. And, but I was going there, and I had to make the decision to treat everyone there with dignity and respect, regardless of what they were in there for. Because they, I could have been encountering other innocent people, but you know what was most likely was I was in, going to be encountering mur murderers and rapists and you know people who had done horrible things. And when I got there, you know, they thought I was a guilty person, you know, guilty of committing the worst act, and they treated me horribly, and, and you know tried to kill me, you know, my first few years there, I mean, it was, it was madness. But by approaching them from the standpoint of human being and, and treating them with dignity and respect, um, over the years that won out and those people, you know, in turn treated me with respect and I was able to see a growth process there in the Department of Corrections, a change in the people that I was around. Um, I met many people who had been on death row and had had their sentences commuted to a term of life without parole. And the lessons I was getting from them was, you know, one of life's of heartache. You know, I'm like, how in the world did these people's lives go so awry that they would commit murders and do those things? And I was able to hear their story because they had not been executed. They were there and they were able to share their stories, you know, with the other inmates there, um, with me, with, with guys who, you know, just had short amount of times were coming in and out. So they were there to teach and say, hey, this is what is wrong with society and this is what goes wrong. You know, and, and people were able to heal from that and learn from that. And, and these are opportunities that would not be there if they were executed and killed. So this is an opportunity for us as a society to learn what's going wrong. Why, what, what happens to a person that they would lead a life of crime when then you learn they've lived lives of abuse. So then, once we identify those problems, then we can start, you know, putting our resources towards education, towards family support and things like that. And you got to think too, you know, the people who you know these murderers or whoever who are, are deserving of execution, they leave behind families too. And what type of, you know, bad health are we leaving for them if we execute their family members and they're not able to learn from them and grow up? So that's a reason why we shouldn't practice killing. 
Thank you for your time. Um, our best friend, he was on death row at the time for a crime he didn't commit, and the only opportunity given to save his life was to take the Alfred plea. Um, when I was 16, I was facing the death penalty, and they were trying to execute me, and they, they told me, you know, we don't want to kill you, but we want to kill your best friend. If you would testify against him, we would give you, first they came to me with 20 years, then with five years, but this, this essential thing is, I didn't see him kill anybody. I don't believe he killed anybody, and for me to say anything else would be murder, you know, so I ended up getting life without parole, which is a long death, but it's one that you can have hope. Um, but they were trying to execute him, and honestly, you know, if it hadn't been for a worldwide support, prayers, um, people capturing our trial on video tape for people to see, I believe the state would have really would have executed him, and they wouldn't even given us the opportunity for an Alfred. And I'd like to say, think about, it took 18 years for Jason to be out. He's only been here two years out free. He, he lived more of his life in prison than free. And he had, as he says, a tremendous amount of support from people with influence and people with money. And it took 18 years, even with that, to reverse a wrongful conviction. The death penalty is a carrot for prosecutors and judges to make career changes, career advancement, and is very often, from my research, <laughs> very, very often used that way. Not about providing us with safety, but about career advancement. So when I, I mentioned the term convictability, for example, in the O.J. Simpson trial, that prosecutor said he was not allowed to go for the death penalty because they knew they could not convict him. They could not win because he was famous, because he was well-liked. So someone like Jason, who they say had a bad reputation, someone like my sister, who had was a drug user, had some minor criminal background, they are trash. They are disposable. And so you go for the death penalty, and the prosecutor in my sister's case made his career out of it. The judge did too. And 18 years later, again, 18 years he got out, I was hoping this was the lucky year for my sister. Um, she hasn't even been hurt. Jason did go through the appeals process. It's unheard of. Never been hurt yet. And that's got to be an issue. It's got, people have got to know these things go on. If we take away the death penalty, we, we, and we have life without parole, then we can deal with a live person and try to make amends and, and try to work on the system so that we don't give the wrong people life without parole also. Um, Cam Cameron Todd Willingham in Texas was executed in the year 2004. The forensics today say he was undoubtedly innocent. We can't undo that. He was a father with children at the house burned down. He was executed for that because they blamed him for the fire. They said he said it. And now the forensics indicate that he did not. We can't be making these mistakes. There's, as Dick said, so many reasons to not have this in place. It's simple. Um, we can end the death penalty this year. Think about how you would want your child to be treated. Jason was someone's child when this happened. Um, picture his mother and the horror that she went through. Um, how your sister, my sister, went through a horrible experience. You, you aren't prepared for this. You don't know what to do. Sitting here, you can say, well, you should have done this, this, or that. You never expect to be on trial for murder, or let alone the death penalty. Think about what you would want if it was your loved one in this situation. And think about the people that we're talking about, 3,220 of them on death rows in the United States. They have people that love them and people that are hurt, as Jason mentioned. It it's ripples outward. It affects their children. It affects their families. And as Dick Morgan stated, we have the ability to safely house convicted people without risking the public safety. So where is the excuse for killing? No one brought up for revenge. <laughs> of course, they say justice, usually. Can you even justify that when we can give them a sentence, as Dick said, that was as horrific as taking away their life's freedom? We should not be killing. 
And we have 142 people who have been exonerated from death row in the United States since 1972. There's a sheet of all of them back there. It's very long. That's 142 mistakes that we found. Those are the lucky ones. And usually it happens from outside sources, not the government process, despite the government process. It is a great process and country, but it's human beings, it is fallible, it is not perfect. We're talking about life and death. How do we know um, who is really guilty or innocent in their hearts? As Bishop Subic said, what do we know, how do we know what's in someone's heart? And how, could, how do we know the total story behind that life? And what part did we play in creating the human being that carried out such horrific violence? We don't forget the victims, the victims' families. We love them, we commiserate with them, and we don't wish to add more pain to the human suffering that is here in the United States with more killing. Bishop Zubich spoke of the love of God and forgiveness of God, and what can any human being possibly do to separate themselves from that kind of power and love? And we presume too much when we take the place of God and make these judgments. As we said in our title, and what we believe at Fellowship of Peace Foundation is compassion is the biggest, most powerful way to live and make change and make a peaceful society, not retribution. The, the opposite of compassion and forgiveness is fear, anger, and hatred. And we can all see what that creates. True change and true peace will begin with compassion and end with love. You can make a difference. We have the campaign postcards here that you can sign on and let the, your legislators know if you want them to look at this bill and let it come through and repeal the death penalty. If we don't let them know, they don't know how to um, address this issue. It's very, very under the radar. So please spread the word to friends and family. It's simple. Um, we can end the death penalty this year.